today. Uh, this morning, I want to share, before I really dive into the message, I want to share uh, something with you that I shared at our local church conference on Sunday night. And um, you know that we are passionate about and uh, desirous to reach the people in our community who do not yet know Jesus Christ. There are about 40,000 people in Grant County alone who do not know Jesus. And we want to introduce them to him, and not only that, but we want to disciple them and to help them to become more like Christ because the Great Commission is not just about uh, telling them the good news about Jesus. It's about teaching them and helping them to become um, devoted followers of him. And so we talk about that a lot. It's not just something that we are doing. It is really what God has called us to do. It is what we are as a church, right? Is to reach people who do not yet know Jesus and to disciple them. And so one of the things that we uh, decided to do was um, to have a a strategic... uh, uh, an organization that helps with strategic planning and strategic uh, vision casting come and meet with some leaders of our church. And out of that process, uh, we developed a new mission statement. And I want to share that mission statement with you today. Uh, our new mission statement that has been approved by the board, probably going to have to do something with this. I'm making a lot of noise. Uh, our new mission statement is, we exist to deliver hope and freedom through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. The reality is, is we just to get to offer it. It's nothing that we have in and of ourselves, but there is freedom and hope in Jesus, and we get to deliver it, and people's lives are transformed. And so this is our, our new mission statement, and I would just love for us to say it together this morning, all right? Can we do that? Let's do this. We exist to deliver hope and freedom through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. You'll see us shorten that at times probably where it may just say delivering hope and freedom or you may see the whole thing, but this is uh, our mission statement. This is um, what we really want to begin to focus on. Um, There's also three initiatives that we have have begun to work on. Uh, One is our first impressions. Just uh, when people come into our doors, we want to be ready for them. We want to greet them. We want them to be able to... uh, just feel comfortable. And so if you're a first-time guest this morning, uh, you can help us out. If if something that we have done or have not done that would have been beneficial to you, uh, feel free to to come and talk to me. I'd love to have that conversation with you. So first impressions is something that we're going to focus on. Another thing is our communication strategy. We're just going to focus on how we communicate and communicating in a way that helps uh, us as a church really uh, present the message and who we are as a community in a uniformed way. And so we work on our communication strategy. And the third thing is uh, leadership development, about being a community that develops leaders, which I will actually talk a little bit about in in this morning's uh, teaching, being a church that develops leaders. Uh, And uh, we we do a great job at this. I think we do a great job at this, but we want to continue to get better at this. And so I just want to share that with you. That's really not a part of my sermon, but uh, it's free today. And so all that was free, so it doesn't cost you anything. So uh, anything that's free is good, right? Probably not, but uh, so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, But um, before I dive in, I know I prayed, but let me pray again and just ask God to help us as we really focus on the mission that God has called us to. God, as we come to you, we thank you for these moments. We pray that you will help us uh, to really deliver that hope and freedom to a world that needs it. It's through the transforming power of Jesus Christ that that's even possible. It's not us. And so, God, I pray that uh, you will help us to be a community that really reaches those people who do not yet know Jesus and disciples them and disciples us. It helps us to grow stronger in our faith as well. And so thank you for this time uh, together this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever watched a movie or uh, you've been watching it and you hear the music begin to change and you know something is about to happen, right? That, that it kind of it kind of begins to amp up a little bit and you're like, uh, I don't watch scary movies, I, but they say people who watch scary movies, they, they know when something bad is about to happen, right? And so we, we, we see that with movies. Uh, any of you who are outside a lot, you, you kind of get used to the outdoors, you get this idea of when the weather's about to change, right? The wind is kind of blowing a, a little different. As I'm getting a little older, I now I start to have knees and joints that ache when the weather's about to change. And so we begin to see when the weather is about to change, we get this sense of what is taking place. Uh, maybe you're watching a, a ball game 
And there are these moments when there's a possession by a team or there's an interception thrown when you just get the idea that the momentum of the game is about to change. One team has, has had momentum, things are going well, and because of a couple of circumstances, you can just sense the tide is beginning to change. Maybe you're reading a book, and as you're reading the book, uh, in the pages, the story begins to develop, and as the story begins to develop, you realize that what you have known up to this point is about to be different. I think that is what begins to happen in the chapter that we read today. Just to catch you up in case you haven't been here, we're in a series on the book of Acts called The Launch. It's this series where we're looking at how God launched the early church, his, his first followers, really into history. And they, they became this transforming uh, force in history. And, uh, and so in the book of Acts, we get to chapter 9, and we begin to see the winds begin to change. The winds are about to change because there's a man who comes back up on the scene named Saul. Now, uh, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, his name is Saul at this point. Uh, later, he takes the name Paul. And if I say Saul or Paul throughout the service, it's because I'll just, I'm just getting confused. And it's the same person, all right? Later, he takes the name Paul. But at this moment, his name is Saul. And um, he is on his way to Damascus. He's on his way. He actually has the papers in hand to uh, persecute the believers who are in Damascus. Paul was a very influential guy. In fact, uh, in, in earlier in Acts, we see this story. We probably, when we see him the first time, it's a story when a man named Stephen is stoned. Paul is there holding the jackets uh, because he was the one in charge, probably. And he's there, he's holding the jackets as a, as a stone Stephen. And so uh, Paul is on his way to Damascus to cause more chaos. And he has this encounter with God. He has a counter with, an encounter with God that will begin to change his life, to transform his life. And I found it interesting that in this encounter, God uses a bright light to, to really get Paul's attention. And as a result of this encounter, Paul becomes physically blind for three days. But let me tell you, Paul was already blind before he has this encounter with God. Paul is already blind because he is spiritually blind. He is blind to the new things that God is doing around him. He is blind to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that he has been longing for. And so while, while Paul has this encounter with, uh, with, uh, with God, he experiences this bright light. He is physically blinded. He was already blind. And then he has this encounter with God. And while he... Um, while he was physically, while this encounter physically blinded him, his eyes were actually open to actually see what God was wanting to do in his life. This idea of spiritual blindness and spiritual sight is an is a idea or a theme that really is seen throughout the scriptures. This idea that all of us at some point, or, or maybe even now, have lived in spiritual darkness. We have, we have not truly been able to see what God is wanting to do in our lives. And this idea of spiritual sight is this theme that runs its way through scriptures. I'm reminded of uh, one of my passages of, of scripture that I love. It's from Luke chapter 2. It's Jesus getting ready to start his ministry. He goes into the temple, he picks up the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and he says, the spirit of, Lord, of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I cannot help but think that when Jesus makes this proclamation, he is looking into the future, and while he knows there will be people who will experience actual physical healing from their blindness, he is thinking about so much more. He is thinking about his mission, his mission that will open people's eyes, that they will be able to see God at work in their lives. He is also talking about the spiritual blindness that people uh, are experiencing, and he says, I have come that they might have sight. With this idea that one of the spiritual themes, one of the threads that runs through the scripture is this idea that God has come to give us spiritual sight. That Paul's story in, in Acts chapter 9 is so much more than just a story about his physical blindness. It is a story about his spiritual awakening. 
I want to press in on a couple thoughts today. The idea that all of us, all of us must be on guard. We must understand because there is the potential that all of us have spiritual blind spots within our lives. Even if, for those of us who have been a follower of Jesus Christ, we, we still must uh, realize that, that there are potentially blind spots within our lives. Paul, um, if you think about Paul or Saul, um, and if you're a Jewish person in, in Paul's day, um, Paul is actually a, a devout guy, right? We have a tendency to think of Paul as this bad guy who is going out and killing people. But if you're a Jewish person in Paul's day, in Saul's day, he is actually a very devout Jewish uh, religious person. He is um, doing right by God, he thinks. He is going out and he is, um, he is standing up for the faith. But he is blinded. He is blinded by the new things that God is doing. He is blinded by, by what God is, is doing in the world. And at times within our lives, we must be careful because even in our attempt to do what we think is right, if we do not allow God's Holy Spirit to speak to us, we can become spiritually blind and we have blind spots. We have attitudes that maybe we have had for years. And we've just simply learned to excuse them. Or we've just simply thought that they were okay. Or we have never truly understood that God is wanting to change our thoughts. We have maybe patterns of our lives that, that we have lived in. And, and they're patterns that really, if we were honest, um, hinder our relationship with Jesus Christ, but they have simply become blind spots. Did you know as humans we are guilty of, of self-deceiving ourselves? Right? We, we, can become, um, we can become in such routines, such patterns, that we actually um, self-deceive. As they say, we don't know what we don't know. In the book, I Told Me So, which is a great title of a book, right? That's just a great title, I Told Me So. It says this, self-deception is a major part of what defeats, de defeats our spiritual formation in Christ. In self-deception, the individual or the group refuses to factors that are hindering us from becoming all that you desire us to become. God, would you reveal those to us and give us the courage to surrender them to you? In Jesus' name, amen. There's something else about this story I, I, I want to just briefly talk about, and that is the fact that um, it's impossible for us to really know what God is doing in people's lives. Uh, Paul, or Saul, in this chapter, the chapter starts out with, he is, he is uttering threats, he has gotten the letters, and in just a few verses, he has this transformational uh, experience within his life. And um, everything changes. If you would have asked Saul's friends, do you ever think that Saul will become a follower of Jesus Christ? The answer would have been resounding no. If you would have asked Paul, have you ever thought about becoming a fo follower of Jesus Christ? The answer would have been a resounding no. But see, God is working in people's lives in ways that we don't know. People who are bitter, people who have been hurt, people whose, whose life d does not seem to reflect that of Jesus Christ at all, people who, who say they have no interest in God. The story of Saul reminds us that God is working in ways that we do not see. And, and what the good news is, is that we get to partner with people to help them see the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. We, we get to become partners. I love the story. God speaks to Ananias. God speaks to Ananias and he says, there's a guy named um, Saul who is praying right now. I, you need to go have a conversation with him and um, you need to lay your hands on him so he can receive sight. And while, while in that moment, Paul receives 
uh, physical sight, I think so much more is happening because in that moment, Paul is beginning to get a spiritual sight that he's never had before. And we get to partner with people to help them see Jesus Christ in us. The, the reality is, is he still plays the biggest part, all right? He is the senior partner in the gig. We're just a junior partner, but he does offer us the opportunity he offers us the opportunity to partner with him to help people see. And can I tell you, there's nothing more that excites me than for us as a community of faith to get to come along beside people and get to help them to see the hope and the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. And not only help them see it, but disciple them. Help them to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. There, there's something exciting about that, and he asked us to partner with him. We get to speak into people's lives. We get to speak into people's lives and tell them the truth that is found in Jesus Christ. And not only speak the truth, we get to live it out. They get to see it in us. Ah, I get excited that God chooses us. He allows us to partner with him to offer freedom and hope to people. That should excite all of us. If I had a shout, uh, you know, like they have laugh, laugh, laugh tracks on like the TV shows. If I had a shout track, I'd play it right now. Because that should excite us because, because people are, are dying and going to hell. They're not being discipled and to be followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, go on and lay your hands on them and help them see. We get to invest in people. I think about the people in my life who have invested in me. I'm actually uh, reading a book called Hero Maker. And uh, it has a quote in it that says, everybody wants to be the hero but few understand the value of being a hero maker. I think about my youth pastor, Wes. When I was a teenager, um, Wes came along beside me, and he just invested in me. He began to, to, to say things to me like, Tony, I see in you whatever it was. He, he began to say, Tony, I believe God has big plans for you in this area. Or, or, Tony, I see in you, and you just name it. And he, he just began to, to speak into me over and over and over again. And, and, and he helped me see in me what I did not even see in me. He helped others see in me what even others may have not seen in me. And all of us have the opportunity not to be the hero but to be the hero maker, to make heroes out of other people who will in return go and make heroes out of more people. I, um, thanks to Wes, I mean, God's call was on, on my life, but he, he coached me and he mentored me into ministry and, and, uh, and people who went into all walks of life, honestly. And now I have the opportunity and others have the opportunity to speak faith into other people. This is how the church multiplies. This is how the church really grows is when we begin to invest ourselves into other people and we get to speak into people. I see in you what God is doing. Th this is what Barnabas does. If you read the story, you go past verse 15 down to about verse uh, 26. Uh, Barnabas was a guy uh, in the early church, and the rest of the church was like, this Saul guy, stay away from him. I know he's claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but we know what he's done. I mean, this is the guy who has been killing us, literally. But Barnabas says, hey, hey, wait a minute. I see God at work in him. Let me introduce you to Saul. Ananias got to say, play the same role. I wonder who are you investing in? Who are you engaging with? Who are you having the conversations with that says, I see in you? I, wanna, I wanna, just want to, I think all of us can do this, but I want to make a special little challenge right here. 
if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, especially if you have been a follower of Jesus Christ for a long time, I think of no better role you get to play in the life of a community than coming into people's lives and saying to them, I see God at work in you. We get to do that. God offers us spiritual sight. I don't know, I have, um, in my life, there have been a few times when I have been in places that have been pitch black and I have had the, the tendency to run into a lot of things, stub my toe in a lot of places, it not, not a fun experience. And we live in a world that is walking around in darkness and we get to turn the light on. We get to show them the, the, the truth of Jesus Christ. We get to lay our hands on them and say, receive sight through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. You know, I am convinced that when we all really allow God to reveal those things to us, to really uh, speak into others, that we will be a community where spiritual heroes are made. You know, um, one of the great ways that, uh, one of the great opportunities that we have to do that self-reflection is in moments of communion. Communion, uh, we believe, is a sacrament, a means of grace that is really open uh, to anyone who's walking in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. But we also uh, value it as a time of reflection, a time of, of introspection to allow God's spirit to speak to us. And we're gonna enter a time of communion, and uh, we'll be receiving it through intention. You can come forward, tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the juice. We have gluten-free stations uh, in the back. And, uh, but I hope in this moment, in this moment, that you will stop and that you will reflect. Allow God to really search you. The night that our, our Lord Jesus was uh, betrayed, um, he was with his disciples. They were celebrating Passover and they took the bread and he broke it and he passed it and he said, uh, you know, every time you do this, you and all who come after you will have a vivid reminder of me. The same way he, he took the, the cup and, and they passed it and he said, you, know, you and all who come after will have a vivid reminder of me. It's this moment of self-reflection, of receiving grace, of allowing God's spirit to speak into our hearts and into our souls. And so-